for the Manchester to begin with. It doesn't really have much to do with my talk, but I thought since this is the version of that war, you're in Manchester, I thought I might show you some of the material in the Manchester relating to this war and the time here. Then I'll talk about the, the Rutherford war um, as it was conceived and viewed mostly by experimentalists in the 19th. And I want to talk about the relationship that emerged in that period between um, experiment and theory. And I want to uh, present to you very quickly um, the way in which I see the development of what was becoming nuclear physics between the wars in the 1920s. And it's a discipline that emerges out of context and controversy. Uh, I hope to show that picture and to show you why that matters for our understanding of what comes back. Uh, then I want to talk um, about a late challenge to what by the late 1920s had become the orthodoxy of the Rutherford Bohr atomic model. Uh, this was put forward by somebody called John Teton, who was a naval architect and marine engineer, and his engineering background turns out to be really important in understanding why he came up with the different <coughs> model of the atom that he did, and perhaps it's important in understanding why he was treated the way he was by the physics community. So then I turn to the fate of John Tutin's alternative atom, and what it tells us. The, the important question is, so what? We can articulate the development of the theory, but so what? What does it tell us about the process of that's what I'm interested in towards the end of this talk. What does all this tell us about the dynamics of physics as a community in these war period? Uh, so, just to touch down on for at Manchester. This is the Victoria University of Manchester in the early 20th century. You'll see here the, the tram lines. This is Oxford Road, just outside, just over there, where the drum is. So this is Oxford Road. Uh, the drum is over here. Uh, the museum over last night is now there. Um, and this is what's now the Liverpool Hall. Uh, and Cooglin Street uh, is down here. So this is where the physical is down there. Uh, here's uh, Rutherford's group in 1910 with Arthur Schuster, Fried Sessa, and Rutherford, and uh, a whole bunch of luminaries that you'll recognise Ernst Marston, Hans Geiger. Uh, Rutherford himself, uh, William Kay, who I'll talk about briefly, Walter Macover, Aaron Slade, who becomes the research director of ICI, who will come to the a bit later on. Um, Bohr, Niels Bohr, arrives here in 1912, and this is the University Archives uh, Register of Admissions to Hume Hall, a residential hall uh, to the south of the university, and this is where he stayed when he came. Manchester, and here's a record of his admission to him all. Uh, he's come here uh, to work in the Manchester laboratories after work with Sir J.J. Thompson of Cambridge. Uh, entered the hall April 1912, left, returned to Copenhagen July 1912. And there's a bit of description of his subsequent career. There. Uh, all institutions involved with students like to keep a record of those students' later careers, and so forth, with people. This is the university's um, employment record for Niels Bohr. These are the various appointments to which uh, he, he uh, attained. Reader in mathematical physics for two years in 1914, and reappointed and reappointed and reappointed, uh, and then he goes to Copenhagen. Uh, again, the university is keen to note that he was awarded the Copley Medal of the Royal Society in 1938. <clears throat> Uh, now, that, uh, the readership in mathematical physics to which Bohr was famously appointed here uh, in 1914, when I went to look at the university appointments registers, um, I had a bit of a surprise. Because in the biographies of Rutherford that I know and the ones of Bohr that I've read, um, it's presented as a fait accompli, the appointment of Bohr to the readership in mathematical physics in succession to uh, Charles Godwin Darwin who had been Rutherford's house theorist before. But when the Vice-Chancellor of the University in the chair and Professor Lamb of Mathematics and Professor Rutherford of Physics met in May 1914 to discuss the readership in Mathematical Physics, a very small committee, um, 
they agreed uh, the terms for the post, they agreed how it would be advertised, and the following month, in June 1914, applications were received from 17 candidates for the readership and mathematical visit in 1914, and the following attended for interview. Mr. Andrew Young, Mr. H.C. Napier, and Mr. H.F. Bates. The committee do not think it necessary further to consider the qualifications of Mr. Napier and Mr. Bates for the readership. Uh, they thought that um, Young might be a possibility, but they clearly didn't want him, and they decided to reactize and to look for the candidates. So Rutherford was encouraged to do that, and later in June 1914, an even smaller committee of Vice Chancellor and Just Rutherford uh, decided to recommend the readership in mathematical physics, Niels Paul, PhD, of the University of Copenhagen. So, candidates have been considered before Paul and rejected, which I didn't know. Find it quite interesting. And I'd like to know who those three actually were and what happened to them. Perhaps there are people in the room who know who Biggs, Napier, and Young were. Biggs does appear in Moore's correspondence in the 1920s. Okay. Moore was trying to get him to copy him. He was in Oxford at the time. He was in Oxford in the 20s. Who was Andrew Young, who was involved in computer science at Liverpool? Maybe the same man. <laughs> okay. Um, so Biggs was in Oxford at the time. Here's the official uh, contract of Niels Bohr on appointment to the readership of mathematical physics in 1914. And we do know something about H.F. Biggs, the other, one of the other candidates for the readership. He was, in fact, appointed to um, a junior assistant lectureship in mathematics uh, nearly at the same time. So those are some insights, I hope, into um, what relatively little we have in the way of documentary evidence of Bohr's time. Uh, Manchester, so it, it does give you some sense of, of his time here. Okay, um, I want to turn now to the Rutherford Bohr nuclear atom, um, and more specifically a challenge to it in the early 1930s. I need to set some of the background in the 1920s, and particularly um, to talk about the evidential basis for the continued belief in the Rutherford Bohr atom in the 1920s. Now, in addition to Bohr's work making mathematical sense of Rutherford's nuclear model, Rutherford's own ongoing experiments here in Manchester with William Kay, who we saw in the early photograph, his laboratory <coughs> student, seem to indicate in 1917 that the putative nucleus could be disintegrated, that by firing alpha particles that it fix could be chipped off it. And that very idea gave strong credibility to the notion of the nuclear atom, which was still itself one of several models being discussed at that time. Now, Rutherford would christen those bits that were chipped off the nucleus protons in 1920, and that opened up the whole idea of a nuclear structure. Once you could chip something off it, the nucleus sort of seems to come into a real existence. And the idea that the bits could be chipped off opened up ideas of nuclear structure. There's nascent nuclear physics, but it's not called that for another 12 or 13 years. <coughs> Other evidence was accumulating <coughs> for, for this idea. By the time that Rutherford went from Manchester to Cambridge in 1919 to the Cambridge Laboratory, succeeding his former teacher J.J. Thompson, the work of Frederick Soddy, and the experimental work of Francis Aston had shown that um, isotopes existed. The isotopes, uh, in Aston's case, of the light elements, and in Soddy's case, of the, the radioactive elements. Um, isotopes, um, the idea that you could have um, elements with, apparently with slightly different masses led credence to the idea that nuclei might have structure which could explain the notion of isotopy. Um, and Aston spent the next um, 25, 30 years working out in detail through his mass spectrograph and mass spectrometers uh, all the detailed isotopes of the element. You'll see several photos of Aston in this presentation. Notice that he's wearing the same suit in every single one of them. I don't think he changed his suit for this entire period. <coughs> so, uh, by 1920, 
humanity in the wake of a destructive war which decimated countries, economies, and science. The Rutherford Bohr model was coming to be widely, if tentatively, accepted. Rutherford returns to Cambridge in 1919 and establishes a program um, continuing those experiments that started in Manchester of nuclear disintegration, trying to chip away at the nucleus to draw some conclusions about its constitution. He was assisted in those experiments by James Chadwick, who had worked with him. This is Rutherford's lab in Manchester. This is the Cavendish Research Group in 1920. That's James Chadwick, who had worked with Manchester with Rutherford here before the war, had been trapped in Germany during the war in terms of war uh, comes back and he becomes Rutherford's lieutenant in the nuclear disintegration experiment in the 1920s. He became a key figure in the development of uh, recognize anyone else in this photo who's germane to the topics that we've been talking about? Mm-hmm. J.J. Thompson, Rutherford. Right. And do you recognize him? G.P. Thompson, George Patrick Thompson, J.J.'s son, electron refraction, Nobel Prize 1957. Do you recognize him? Compton. Compton. Not Compton. Um, He's going to become important in that story as well. Charles Ellis. Uh, Charles Thomas Ellis. <clears throat> okay, so uh, Rutherford starts this series of nuclear disintegration experiments in the 1920s. Wild Bohr and the mathematical <coughs> colleagues who work on the mathematical theories of the atom, which we've heard much about today. There's an experimental program going on as well, in which Rutherford and his colleagues are using scintillation counting experiments, very delicate, very difficult optical counting of tiny, tiny scintillation try and figure out something about nuclear structure. Those experiments are fragile, uh, they're difficult to manage, and they're epistemologically contentious in this period. From 1920 to 1923, the Cavendish Laboratory can manage the epistemological uncertainties around those experiments because they have this field to themselves. In 1923, another lab enters the field. From the Institute for Radiumforschung in Vienna, Hans Petterschon and his colleagues start to compete with the Cavendish Laboratory in these nuclear disintegration experiments. They come up with very different results. They deny what the Cavendish Laboratory is claiming. They claim uh, things that can't be repeated in the Cavendish and vice versa. Replication becomes a really crucial issue between Cambridge and Cambridge. <coughs> <clears throat> in this period. That controversy runs from 1923 to 1927 and only comes to a private conclusion in December 1927 when Chadwick, who's running these experiments in Cambridge, goes himself to Vienna, to the Institute for Art and Forschung, and he runs a series of controlled experiments. He takes charge of the experiments in Vienna and he shows that when Cambridge counting techniques are imposed in Vienna, the Viennese results fall into line with those in Cambridge. So this becomes a dispute about how you do the experiments properly, rather than about the results of the experiment. Now you have to bear that in mind. There's a second controversy going on between Charles Ellis, who we saw in the 1920 photo, and Lisa Meitner in Berlin over the nature and interpretation of the beta spectrum. These guys are arguing with each other for several years about nuclear <coughs> structure. Now, the important point I want to make is that these were disputes about matters of fact. The Cambridge Vienna and the Cambridge Berlin controversies were disputes about matters of fact, but they were not disputes about the essential orthodoxy of the Rutherford Bohr nuclear model of the atom. That's a really important point. All actors accepted the legitimacy of that model. The second important point I want to make very quickly is that these controversies precipitated the introduction of new techniques into this field of experimental physics of the nucleus. Wireless was the big growth area in the 1920s, and electrical wireless techniques, valves, began to be used for electrical counting methods, displacing optical scintillation counting. That becomes very important. The actors became very open to new theoretical technologies like wave mechanics, which is coming on the scene in the late 1920s. They become open to machines for the production of fast particles. Accelerators become very important. 
All of this brings a new series of actors into emerging nuclear physics. It brings Lejolius in Paris, it brings Botha and Bosa from Germany, De Bruyne, Maurice De Bruyne, not Louis De Bruyne, from Paris, Motu, Lawrence, and others in the States. All these guys pile in into the field in the late 1920s to try and sort out the complexity. This is becoming the field of nuclear physics. Okay, I'm going to go on to then John Tutin and his atom. John Tutin, does anybody here know the historian of science, Rob Island? By any chance? Yeah. It's the spitting image of yeah, it Rob yeah. Island. It's all it seems to me. Okay, so John Tutin is a naval engineer and scientific consultant. In the late 1920s, he had some success with um, naval rudders. Uh, ship towers and stuff like that. He uh, was taking out patterns on these sort of marine engineering devices. His interest in atomic physics began when he read Frederick Soddy's uh, 1932 update of his original 1909 interpretation of radium. He updated in 1932 the interpretation of the atom. Tutin reads it, gets very interested in the early history of the nuclear atom. Now, Soddy had always had a bit of a gripe about the physicists and the atom, and Tutin, so I, I think, picked up on that, and he went back to the original 1909, 1910, 1911 papers, and he spotted that ambiguity that had been there from the beginning. Rutherford, when he articulated the nuclear model of the atom, was never sure whether it was negative or positive. He didn't say until quite late on, so when the Rutherford bore atom came into being by 1913, that certainty settled around that question. Tutin goes back, and he wants to unpick that settlement that the nucleus is definitely positive. He wants to complicate the nucleus. He uses his engineering background to produce a sort of inverted model of the atom, where instead of the heavy mass being concentrated in the nucleus and the light electrons circulating it, he wants a flywheel model of the atom with a light nucleus and the heavier particles orbiting the light nucleus. And for an engineer, that's a much more satisfying concept, and it works much better. Okay. So he publishes a book in 1934 called The Atom, where he lays out, element by element, his competing version of nuclear theory. He comes up with a very elaborate series of structures and substructures, some of which you can see in this table. These are his alternative structures. A's, B's, and C's, and P's represent particular combinations of electrons and protons. This is far too complex to get into now. Uh, he compared and contrasted the Rutherford and Bohr models, uh, sorry, his own and um, the Rutherford and Bohr models. And summarizing, he said that um, the Rutherford atom is accepted by the scientific world because at the time of its birth there was no suggestion that abnormal forces due to quantum laws might come into play and make possible an unforeseen rigidity. It inspired a model swift and increasing confidence because in spectroscopy in particular it gave quantitative results of extraordinary accuracy. But these results, he argued, are equally applicable to the alternative atom. He said that his, his atom had much more industrial relevance than Rutherford. Cambridge physicists don't react well to this. This is a letter from George McCarrow, who is one of John Cockcroft, the Cavendish physicist, one of his industrial colleagues, writes to him and says about Tutin's argument. I forgot whether, it tell, whether I told you, but it seems for a sight of Tutin's paper, which has been submitted to Royal Society, sums of money have been paid by two well-known organizations, <coughs> industrial companies, and a sum of five guineas to the National Third have not been paid. It's so difficult to know what to charge for these professional, or shall we say, unprofessional services. He also says, many thanks for returning Tutin's masterpieces manuscript with your criticism. We entirely agree with you, this is to Cockcroft in Cavendish, that the sooner this thing is killed, the better. I wonder if it will ever be published, or if people who know more about modern atomic theory than do Tutin and Soddy will manage to stop it. I hope they do. And they did stop it. Um, referees in the Royal Society and the Chemical Society refused to publish it. Soddy resigned from the Chemical Society, of which he was a member, because the referees refused to publish a manuscript communicated by Soddy. 
was a fellow of this time. He resigned and sold all his copies of the journal from the Society, very, very popular. <coughs> uh, finally, uh, Ralph Fowler, Rutherford's <coughs> son-in-law, and a mathematical physicist himself, major contributor to atomic theory in the interior years, <coughs> writes an unprecedented three-full-page review of Tutin's book, The Atom. He has to publish it as a book in the end. Uh, a full three-page review in Nature. Nature reviews are normally just, you know, a paragraph or two. Three pages slating this book almost paragraph by paragraph. And this is what really, I think, at the end of the day, got them. Dr. Tutin's theory has been rather widely noticed in the non-scientific press. The public was starting to take an interest in it and to be misled by this, what they saw as quackery, basically. Where it sometimes be discussed as if it were an accepted theory, a revolutionary overturning of current views. But alas, it is far less momentous. Physical theory has undergone such striking and successful revolutionizing in recent years that such press notices can scarcely be avoided. It's all the more necessary that when a would-be revolution widely heralded fails utterly, its masquerade as success
and my, his credibility from the point of view of modern physics. Um, he said that the Rutherford model couldn't explain certain results of um, industrial significance. So there were certain spectroscopic results to the sulfur and um, certain results to the magnetism of nitrogen compounds that he said were anomalies in the Rutherford model. His model could explain better. And for that reason, he was touting his paper, his long paper, which became the book, around industrial labs um, from about 33 onwards. And at least two labs, I think, offered him research facilities to actually do the experiments to find the evidence to prove his theory. So and I think this is one of the things Cavendish physicists were worried about, that industrialists were starting to take this up and that they might find you know, stuff there. Yeah, yeah, but his theory couldn't explain that angle. Yeah. No, but he, he was countering um, there are things that the, the Rutherford theory can't expect that we've got to start somewhere. <coughs> I thought you slipped a rather large um, choice of interpretation in the last sentence. Have you got any evidence? What was the last sentence? I see. <laughs> <laughs> you said, in fact, the Kevin uh, Cavendish people were trying to get some money. Yeah. And therefore they want to get rid of this. Um, okay. There must be some evidence of that. Here's the evidence for the Cavendish trying to get money. Um, oh, yeah, I do that, except that. But why should they, therefore, be unkind to Tutin, however badly his ideas might be? Because they, they were trying to control press interpretations of what nuclear physics was. Okay? In 1932... Yeah, I understand that. What I mean is that is there is there a, is there a, a piece of written evidence that says we've got it rid of Tutin because he might take some out. Um, I think the use of the word killed in this context is quite interesting. I, I think, you know, if you're looking for a smoking gun about intent to uh, destroy someone and their theory, the, the use of the word killed, which you don't normally see in physicist correspondence, is, is quite telling. I think that, that signifies something. Okay, it's not... It's, are you looking for an even more smoke? Well, I don't gun? actually necessarily disagree with what you said. I used to have an engineer working with me who was fascinated, absolutely certain, you could have their permanent perpetual motion. And he used them in a bright light, and he'd come up every now and then with a new idea. It was almost impossible to show what he wrong. So we did sort of the local version of killing without the, you know, with kindness, kindness based on Okay. You can approach this without um, making a judgment. This, this goes back to what Hassoff was saying um, in, in his uh, thing in the address. You don't necessarily have to make a judgment here about Tutin. What I find interesting is the way in which um, a challenge to uh, an orthodoxy was treated by those who <coughs> had the strongest vested interest in maintaining the orthodoxy, if you like, those closest to Rutherford and his to... Um, yes, I'm afraid that... So you talk to, I must admit that I was totally unaware of this uh, tutin the first time that I hear this name, um, but I don't think that this case is so extraordinary. I mean, it's something that happens, and it's something which happened. Uh, there are sort of corresponding cases uh, in the US, in 1910s and 20s, and uh, in Germany too, and some of these uh, uh, alternatives, so-called, were not even by uh, amateurs are by quacks, but by recognized physicists, uh, Johannes Stark in Germany, for instance. Uh, what is, uh, on the other hand, apparently unique to this case is that the physicists did not just ignore it, uh, because uh, it's highly unusual to have these three or four pages, um, of course, extremely critical, I imagine, um, um, account of it uh, in nature. Uh, and, and, and I guess that is fairly unique, but it's a general phenomenon, and it's certainly one which it still still exists in this, to this day. <coughs> uh, do you see any similarities to the questions from the other speakers? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you see any similarities uh, uh, to the discussion about the theory of relativity? All of such, uh, a lot of engineers who are who are, who are developing uh, uh, counter theories, and then you have this discussion also. Uh, do you 
I don't know is the answer because I've not looked. Um, I'm sure there would be. But you should have, because <laughs> it seems to be very similar to all of what, what uh, Hegel mentioned uh, uh, runs in this direction. Sure. But uh, it seems to be the interesting questions are about the processes going on here and the way in which the boundaries around orthodoxy are maintained and policed. Those seem to be the interesting questions. But the problem of relativity orthodoxy. Yes, and you'll find the same issues, the same general issues about police and I will bring this over because I wanted to go back to the very early talks. Um, unfortunately, Finn, I think, is no longer here. Right? But maybe somebody else may help me with regard to his talk. I mean, it's sort of a known about Bohr that he didn't write his scientific papers. He dictated them all uh, from the very early stage. All right? his, in this sense, his PhD dissertation was written by his mother. His famous trilogy was written by his wife. Then wife got babies, and then he started hiring assistants. So, <clears throat> always claiming that he did not finish his thought if he's writing himself. Uh, and, the, and part of what Finn was doing was sort of telling his sort of inform this. At the very same time, he obviously had absolutely no problem writing tons of letters. Like five very long letters a day. So can, can it be in principle possible that someone is agraphic or claims to be agraphic when regards to a scientific papers at the same time completely prolific in, in writing Baldwin's Thomas correspondence? <laughs> no, no, but right, I like it fine. And, and his letters are very, so which I say, they're so careful and diplomatic, uh, massive, with sort of a massacre written, so uh, with, without too many drafts. Uh, so he obviously can be very comfortable in writing, sort of complicated. So he writes letters in some sense that the reader thinks what the reader wants to, to see. Not exactly. So every read of the letter, so right, puts into letter before that kind of thing. But he did. But he did. But he did write his scientific papers. He did. He did write scientific papers in the beginning. There, there was half times when he went for Cambridge alone, and so there were some times that he passed the graph himself, and and also the. He must have done something. Some, no, some of them. But but. Well, so he, he had granted, and there was no wait for it. I think there is at least one example where a similar thing happened with his letter writing, because uh, when he uh, tried to, to have some reconciliation with Heisenberg again after this famous or infamous visit in 1941, he wrote letter about letter about letter, never sent these letters away. Yeah, okay. I have uh, two questions. I don't know, well, with, with Michael or with uh, Alexi? Uh, with Alexi? Uh, I mean, you showed also the photo in 1936 in Copenhagen and how things have changed in Copenhagen. But also, what's very interesting is, and that brings the Cavendish with Copenhagen together again, is also not only that the times have changed, and but also what you could call the Bohr atom had changed, because uh, in, in, at Copenhagen they were at a very similar place then as we know from Pin's uh, book on, on the, the turn towards nuclear physics. And nuclear physics had really changed to this kind of big machines and the kind of big money coming in. And still, it was still the, the Rockefeller money, but it was a very, very different, different kind of program. So this also, I would say, contributed to this kind of <laughs> dynamics. But I think war was, and I totally, it's totally right that international, I, I mean, that the political scene was very, very different. But Bohr still played a very important role in this kind of international game, right? Well, well he tried, but really after 1933, uh, it was becoming very hard for everyone to do international things. For Rockefeller Foundation, too. I mean, the, yeah, yeah. the, the activities decreased, they started giving less money and less. Uh, so it, uh, there were certain political dynamics that no one can back. And in this sense, sort of, uh, uh, obviously, uh, when the World War II started, it completely disappeared. And then he tried again in the Cold War, in the early Cold War. Yeah. He attempted a similar kind of, basically, his uh, general Scandinavian solution after World War yeah. One was to try to mediate between great or hostile great powers. He thought that maybe he would try, try to basically use uh, increase the imports of Copenhagen in the same way by mediating between the Soviets and the Americans. But the Cold War dynamics was different, and so it didn't work. So he, his um, uh, style worked very successfully in the 1920s, 
but he never, he could never replicate this kind of success in that fitness. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's very interesting in the CERN how you have this kind of notion that oh, he was so much a supporter of CERN, but actually he didn't. Mm -hmm. He actually didn't succeed. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yes, you are still there to, for um, the poor atom in in China. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you you mention with one sentence, but very diplomatically only with one sentence that um, in the 1950s and 1960s, when China had become Red China, uh, Communist China, uh, then both theories were not uh, well accepted. I mean, they were criticized for political reasons. Uh, is it correctly understood that um, this criticism, this ideological criticism, uh, was uh, directed toward the interpretation of quantum mechanics and not specifically uh, to the Bohr idea of atomic structure. Yeah, not the, the, the competition, uh, especially uh, with Hello. the... Yes, so, so it's so louder. Could you try to speak very loud? Okay. <laughs> and so now... Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, um, in the 1960s in China, uh, China uh, followed the followed the Russia, and uh, at that time Russia criticized the uh, the complementary theory. Uh, I mean, I, I say I I mean not the theory of war uh, and the complement, um, um, but uh, focus on the pre uh, explanation for complementary theory. Uh, um, not I think I I think not only the content. The, the, the academic content, but the, um, they focus criticize the focus on focus on the uh, the social and the, the uh, social and the, the government. I think. From that point, the yeah. I think that could not agree with you because that, at that time uh, China built an atomic bomb and so it was necessary to, to have uh, a, a quantum mechanics. The question is, is, is it uh, happens uh, more or less the same as in the Soviet Union? When also in the 40s there was some criticism but then the uh, lobby of the, of the bomb builder uh, was very strong against this uh, ideological campaign. Was there, was there a, a, a similar uh, effect in, in, in China? Um, so you, you, you told that China followed the, the, so, the, the way of the Soviet Union. Right? Mm. The way of the Soviet Union was that there was some uh, criticism in the 40s, yeah. and then they were put down uh, with the background of the success of the, or the working of the uh, Russian uh, or Soviet uh, atomic bomb. So, and, and China built in the 50s also, or, or started to build up or to, to design an atomic bomb. Uh, plays it any role in China too? First, uh, first uh, China followed uh, the Soviet Union, uh, Russia, but uh, when Russia stopped to criticize uh, all this, uh, uh, another uh, scientist in uh, the Russia uh, uh, psychology, um, a famous uh, scientist, uh, and uh, when they stopped by the China, they were to criticize. And uh, I, I don't think so that it is some. Um, mm -mm. Maybe there is some uh, connection between uh, the atomic, atomic bomb with uh, the Soviet Union because in uh, the end of the 50s and the, in the early of the 60s, uh, Soviet Union had to China to build the atom. But in after that, China uh, sent the Chinese students to uh, you know, Denmark like, uh, like these countries. And uh, I, I um, um, it's different the past um, between China and the Soviet Union. Last, last comment. Yeah. Oh, yeah, great. Um, so I want to uh, to get uh, to Jeremiah. Yeah.
um, to talk a little bit more. At, at some point, uh, you said you, you wanted to take theory as practice, and I couldn't agree more, and I think if, if we wanted to, we could have a conversation about how that fits in with Hassock's opening remarks as a, as a way of bridging the sort of internalist-externalist divide. But I also want to get a little bit more sort of conceptual specificity out of what you mean by theory and what you mean by practice. At, at some point you said, well, the math is different, but the technique is the same right. in the new formula. And so I wanted to know, well, if the math is different, what do you mean by technique? Do you mean there's an underlying physical picture that's the same? And can we maybe separate, and this is a preoccupation of some of the stuff we'll be talking about tomorrow, um, in the, the philosophy and physics section, um, you know, that, that can we separate sort of these physical pictures from these maybe epistemological strategies, or, you know, what, what do you mean by method versus model? I mean, I think, so, yeah, I mean, I think I, 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 mean, I, I went over simply in this, I don't feel like in the other people, in the literature on theories practice, We've actually spent enough time working with this to know actually in each case where do we want to make the cuts. Um, in this specific case, I would say that what happens that's the same is with one very small difference the way in which the problem is set up, which includes both the model that's being used, the, the model of um, A, having a fully solved electronic picture, and then treating the nuclear motion perturbation of that, and then the expansion of that around a ratio of the two masses. Okay, so this method comes and goes forward. The only thing that changes in terms of the setup of the problem is whether you take the square root of four. The mathematics, when I say that then changes, is because instead of doing a calculation using the old quantum theory, you the quantum So when you do it this way, you have a different you can actually use perturbation theory without transformation of variables and other things that make the first one much more, the first treatment much more complicated. But the model that's set up, and in a way you can say the results that come out of it are results that are, the results that come out in this way are much more satisfying than that. Because in fact the rotation and vibration parts fall, fall out uh, in this new construction in separate terms, much like they look in this way. So I, I fully agree with you. We need to be very careful, and I did not take enough time, at least in this presentation, in terms of how to dissect that. But I think actually part of the benefit of the approach of theory of practice is to be able to dissect this in ways that do also, as you said, then bridge the internal external body. You can see these things connect with both programmatic statements like what Born made, and then also these programmatic statements, of course, connect very directly to questions about science funding and other We have to finish because we are already uh, after time. So thank you for all for attending and for all the speakers in this. Uh,